Good morning, everyone. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, I welcome all of you here to our service of worship this morning here at the Congregational Church of Amherst, United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we're so grateful to have all of you who are gathered with us here in the sanctuary this morning on this yet another beautiful fall Sunday. And we're grateful to have all of you who are watching our live stream at home, whether here live on Sunday morning or those of you who are catching it later on in the day or later on in the week. We are so happy that all of you have chosen to worship with us here this morning. Now, for those of you who are visiting or who are just coming back uh, after a long time away, there are a few different differences in our service that we're taking um, to protect one another during this time of COVID. You're sitting further apart, you're wearing masks. But there also, there are different points in our service that we've changed as well. If you have a prayer card that you like to submit, we won't be collecting them, but you can fill them out and leave them in the offering plate in the back of the sanctuary, and they'll be brought up later on in the service. We won't be passing the peace by coming out of our pews and hugging each other like we usually do, but we ask you to stay in your pews and pass the peace that way. We don't have a children's time during our service, but we do have an active and vibrant church school, and they are taking advantage of this beautiful day and continuing to meet outside uh, through the entire time that we're in worship together. They will likely move inside next Sunday, but know that they are back there with many of our teachers and our adult volunteers as well. We also have a time of fellowship after our service, which has been outside, but today we are moving back inside into our community room. So if you want to join us down there for some refreshments, you can do so after worship and, and take a peek at our new renovated kitchen if you haven't seen it yet. So we invite you for a time of fellowship after worship. And you're invited to check the spire and our bulletin for all the announcements of the things that are going on in our church community. A couple of things I would like to lift up if you are new or fairly new uh, to our community, you're invited to a, an info session that we're holding on Zoom um, on this Wednesday, November 17th at 7 p.m. Um, there's no obligation to join, just bring your questions and learn more about our church. And if you'd like the link, you can send me an email or contact Andrea in our church office. I want to remind folks that our Women's Association Sleigh Bell Marketplace is live and up and running and ongoing. You can get the link to that online auction through our website. Um, and there you can buy birch bark houses and get gift certificates and gift baskets and, you know, have spend time at vacation homes and buy a holiday decorations and all of that. So you're invited to participate and that is open. The auction is open and live through Sunday, November 28th. Um, and now I'd like to call on our deacon, uh, the deacon in charge of John Swanson, who has an announcement about a special Thanksgiving offering. Well, good morning, everybody. What a beautiful day it is. Uh, the deacons, uh, as we did last Sunday and doing it again this Sunday, we have a special collection that we are taking is for our thanksgiving baskets where we will supply gift cards or food to needy individuals within our own community here and uh, what happens we will collect this money today i'll have this basket in the back um, by the door as you leave and you can put in either a monetary uh, gift or if you brought some gift cards with you for some of our local shopping areas, that would be great too. Uh, we are very appreciative of the gifts that we received last week, and we're hoping to increase a little more this week. So if you can uh, give us a little bit of your extra, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John. And as we prepare to hear our prelude and move into our worship service, I want to just lift up the fact that we are focusing on Psalm 16 today. And this is where the psalmist seeks refuge in the presence of God. 
And we often think of refuge as something that we escape into. To tune out the world or get lost in something other than the pace and the pain of our life or this world. But finding refuge in God is not about escaping the world. It's about feeling the strength and the comfort and the power of God at our backs as we live in the world. So I invite you to ponder all the ways that you seek refuge in life as we listen to our prelude and gather in the spirit of worship. Please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. When we pass through turbulent waters, when we are joyful and celebratory, when we suffer and feel hopeless, whether we feel triumphant or defeated, Come, let us worship together with Emmanuel, God with us. You may be seated. Friends, I will pray for us the prayer of invocation, and I invite you to join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Always present God, we gather together to worship, knowing that you are already here among us, knowing that there is nothing that separates us from your presence. Wherever we are, wherever we go, you are near. So let us enter into this service of worship with confidence and hope, knowing that you are in this space and in this time with us, and that you stand eager to meet us and hold us and inspire us and bless us with your love. 
We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray to you using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, it is that time in the service where we share the peace of Christ with one another. In these COVID times, we are not doing the traditional handshaking, unfortunately, so I invite you to hug the one you're with and send the sign of peace, however that looks for you, to the others around you. May the peace of God be with you. Our scripture reading this morning, as I mentioned earlier, is Psalm 16. Now, the book of Psalms is often described as the prayer book or the hymn book of the ancient Israelites, as many of the Psalms contained within it were either prayed aloud or sung aloud in the context of worship. Now, the name Psalm comes from the Greek word Samoy which means words sung with instruments. Now the book of Psalms contains 150 songs or prayers written by a myriad of individuals, many of whom were anonymous. Now while nearly half of the Psalms are attributed to King David, including the one that we'll read this morning, most scholars believe that these songs and prayers were composed long after David's time and likely date to the period just before and just after the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, when the people of Yahweh had lost everything and were living in exile. Now, the Book of Psalms contains both communal and individual prayers. Some are temple liturgies, some retell the stories of God's covenant contained in the Torah, some tell the story of kings and royal proceedings, and some are prayers of thanksgiving and praise, and some are prayers of sorrow and lament. Now, if we were to compile a similar, similar collection in our time and in our community, it might contain the communal prayers that we print in our bulletins, the hymns and the anthems that we sing in worship, our historical records and our council meeting minutes rewritten as poetry and set to music, if you can imagine that, and an extensive collection of the individual and very personal prayers when we, that we submit when we fill out those prayer cards and either share them in worship or share them with just our pastors, including the prayers that we share anonymously because they're just too painful to own. Now, the most common type of psalms preserved in our Bible are by far the psalms of lament. The prayers and songs that express pain and confusion and fear and frustration and plead with God to intervene on the author's behalf either praising God for being present in times of turmoil or crying in anguish or anger over God's perceived absence or silence. And Psalm 16 is both a song of lament and a song of praise. The only request it contains is right in the very first line where it says, protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. The author recognizes that standing apart from God is to move out from God's protective umbrella. 
as those who worship other gods who lack the power of Yahweh soon realize. But while many of the Psalms of Lament call on God to use that power to smite an enemy or heal an illness or restore what has been lost, the author of this psalm recognizes the power of the umbrella itself as it provides a place of refuge. Not in the sense that it protects those beneath it from harm or offers an escape from the slings and the arrows of the world. Instead, it provides counsel, a steadying presence, and a fullness of joy so that the one who stands with God is better equipped to endure and survive those slings and arrows of the world. The Book of Psalms is a songbook and a prayer book for refugees, for people living in exile. And here the people are reminded that the refuge they seek in their God is with them whenever and wherever they may be. So let's listen to the prayer sung by the author of the Psalm of 16 and listen for the word of God. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who chose, choose other gods multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Here ends our reading from the book of Psalms. May God grant us understanding of these words. So have you ever rolled out of bed in the morning just knowing that it was not going to be a good day? Maybe your legs were aching or your back or your shoulder or some other part of your body where the pain usually settles, whether sporadically or frequently or chronically. And you know as soon as you pull away those covers and swing your feet onto the floor, that this discomfort that you are feeling is going to be with you all day long. Maybe the sense that the day was not going to go well crept into your mind as you made your way through your morning routine. In the moment you realized that you were out of coffee. Or when you poured orange juice on the kid's cereal instead of milk or when you stepped in an unexpected surprise that your cat or your dog left for you right in the middle of the kitchen floor. I'll leave it up to your imagination as to what that surprise might be. And perhaps the feeling that the day was doomed to not be a good one became apparent when your plans for the day were suddenly upended, when the washing machine began to overflow or the kid's school bus never showed, or you checked your email or picked up the phone to find an unexpected crisis thrust upon you, from work 
or from a family member, or the volunteer project that you took on because you thought it would bring joy and peace to your life. And though we may be reluctant to admit it, if we have a habit of starting our day by tuning into the morning news or scrolling through social media to catch up on the latest events of the world, then we're likely familiar with the rising sense of tension or worry or anger or despair that can settle in within us when we turn on this fire hose of information and attempt to take it all in. As the relentless flow of negativity can set the tone for our entire day, making the pain in our back or the overflowing washing machine or the crisis-laden email even more of a mountain than it appears to be. And if we add something even heavier to this pile, like grief, or a struggle with depression, or the relentless voice in our head that tells us we can't face the world without a drink or a drug that puts a barrier between us and our pain. And waking up with the feeling that the day ahead is not going to be a good one is likely our norm rather than the exception. It's on days like these that we often find refuge in the presence of those who've been there, before us and with us. We might lean on a friend or a family member, commiserating with those who know what it's like to walk in our shoes or at the very least understand what it's like to feel so overwhelmed at the end of a bad day or even at the start of it that we just want to climb back in bed and hit the snooze button on everything and everyone who is expecting something from us. And if we are unable to or not feeling up to finding refuge in the presence of another, especially if we're an introvert and find being around people at times like these could be more draining than soothing. There are other ways to find refuge in the experiences of those who've been where we are. We might find our refuge in music, in the tones and melodies and movements that both resonate with our pain and soothe it. We might find a commiserating and comforting present in art or images, in the way that light and shadow and color and texture may surprisingly and simultaneously reflect our inner turmoil and lift our spirits with its beauty. And we might find, the, the, find comfort in the experience of others as they're expressed in the written word in literature, in poetry, in plays and screenplays, in the verses of a favorite song or favorite hymn or in the passages and pages of scripture. One of my favorite authors, Anne Lamott, once wrote that the most powerful sermon in the world consists of only two words, me too. Now, if I preached that every week, we'd certainly get out of here a lot sooner. <laughs> now, in many ways, the stories and poetry and history that we have in our Bible is a 3,000 year long narrative that says, me too. Where we're meant to find comfort and hope or a word of warning or wisdom in the stories and experiences of a people as they seek to understand their God and their world and their place in the eyes of both. The people of Israel, Yahweh's people, came to be known as the people of the book. As they carried the Torah, the law, the history, the covenant that God had made with them wherever they went. But it hadn't always been that way. 
Before they were the people of the book, they were the people of the land. As they told oral stories about how, how they traveled to and set down roots in the promised land that God had liberated them to experience. Then they became the people of the temple as they built a home for their God in their land that became the center of their worship and their ritual and their prayers and their world. But when they lost that temple and their land and were set off into exile, suddenly they were a people with nothing, believing that even their God had been left behind. And that's when they began to write, to compose their story and commit it to parchment and papyrus in a more permanent form of remembering. Looking back at how they came to have it all and then lose it all, believing that they had designed their own tragic fate by failing to live into the covenant they had made with their God. But the ancient stories that they cobbled together from memory and reshaped to explain their current predicament were about much more than a desire to make sense of where they were by looking back at where they had been. It was also about looking ahead. It was about preserving and holding on to their identity in, a fa in the face of occupation and assimilation so they could continue to be the children of Abraham. It was about finding hope in the belief that if they just got back to where they were, if they returned to the law, to the covenant that God had made with them, then they would no longer live in exile. God would restore and redeem their land and their temple. God would restore and redeem them. Now, the book of Psalms may seem like a random collection of prayers and poetry written by a people who were, were lamenting their loss. But read together from beginning to end, the book of Psalms tells a story. The same story that we find in the Torah and in the writings and the prophecies. The story of a God who makes a covenant with creation and its people, promising to walk with them as they live as God's presence in the world, acting as conduits for love and mercy and grace. It's a story of kings and kingdoms and people who continuously behave badly and lose their way. And it's a story of a God who continuously seeks them out and leads them back, offering them refuge and redemption wherever they may be. Now, Psalm 16 is presented as a prayer or song of David as he sought refuge in God while the slings and arrows of his enemies and his own people landed all around him. And whether this prayer originated with David or was written much later, it brought comfort to those living in exile as they looked at David's predicament and said, me too. If David imagined God standing at his side, offering strength and comfort in his time of trial, then perhaps they could imagine the same. Perhaps God hadn't left them behind after all. But sometimes we need more than the comforting words of those who came before us. Sometimes music or art or poetry is not enough to lift us out of our despair. There are ascending levels of what we may think of, of as having a bad day. 
with the irritating mishaps and inconvenient crises and negative news feeds paling in comparison to the days when we feel like the proverbial or literal rug has been pulled out from underneath us. When a loved one dies, or the result of the MRI tells us that nothing more can be done, or our home, or our job, or a treasured relationship is seemingly ripped from our grasp. And we open our eyes the next morning, wondering if we descended into a nightmare that will never end. If at times like these we struggle to find refuge in a 3,000-year-old psalm, or in the songs, or images, or various other creations of those who've walked in our shoes. We may still find refuge in places like this. For even if we struggle to feel God's presence, we do experience the presence of one another. And in the presence of others, we lift up our prayers, and they lift up theirs. And while we say we are lifting up those prayers to God, the less recognized value of public prayer, even when do done so anonymously, is that it lets others know that they are not alone. It's our way of saying, me too. As we tell others, I know what it's like to live with cancer. I know what it's like to have a family member wrestling with addiction. I know what it's like to lose a life partner or to bury a child. I know what it's like to be a survivor of abuse, of trauma, of war. I know what it's like to be broken and what it feels like to long to be whole once again. When we lift up these prayers in community, we give others permission to serve as our refuge, as we offer to be their refuge in return. And in doing so, we are living into that ancient covenant that God made with humanity long ago. The promise that God would be with us and be our refuge as we lived into the commitment to be God's loving and healing and grace-filled presence in this world. So the book of Psalms is a prayer book for refugees a people in exile who've lost their land and their temple, their refuge where they once found their God. And here the prayer book becomes the temple, as we, like the people, enter into it to hear the story of God and the story of God's people sung back to us in poetry and prayer. May we find a similar refuge in this temple and in the presence of our God and in the presence of God's people as we help each other to be whole once again. And thanks be to God and amen.
Prayers of thanksgiving for our bell choir. It was lovely. My friends, we've come to the time in our service where we lift up the prayers that we are holding on our hearts this week. We come together to say, me too. We hold each other's prayers in sort of sacred space together. Right? So I invite you to get comfortable in your seat. Find a way of holding prayer that is meaningful for you. Sometimes I like to hold my hands like this or kind of in more traditional ways. But settle in now for a period of prayer. Holy, loving God. Today we lift up prayers from Marty Warren. Prayers for healing and strength for a family friend, Kara who has been in intensive care for the past three weeks with her baby boy she hasn't even met. They both have COVID. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please pray for the family of Lech Lahovic, who died Thursday, November 4th at Yale New Haven Medical Center. He battled pancreatic cancer for over a year. He was 71 years old leaves wife Susan, two sons, and six grandchildren. Lech was very proud of his Polish heritage. He was a kind, gentle person and friend of Stephen and Joan Egbertson. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I am so grateful to be back in our beautiful sanctuary this morning, surrounded by a loving church family. Thank you to all who have worked so hard to ensure our safety so we can gather together in person. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers for the O'Connor family who lost their teenage son to suicide. Prayers from Katie Henderson. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers from Leona. Prayers from, for healing from crippling anxiety from COVID. And prayers for healing in my sister and me. Renew our communication and forgiveness. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers of thanksgiving today for all those who put time and effort into making our third floor youth room a brand new space. Thanks especially to Gretchen Davis, Kathy Johnson, and one person who remains anonymous, who spent time and money painting and beautifying the room, and to Tim Wiegand for coordinating the carpet cleaning, so the room can be welcoming for so many church groups, from the church school to the men's group. We ask for blessing on all of our church spaces as we move more and more from virtual to in-person gatherings. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers this week for the family of Rick Safares, father of a former youth grouper here at the Congregational Church of Amherst, Matt, who passed away last Thursday. We lift up Pamela, Rick's ex-wife, Matt and his siblings, and for everyone who loved Rick as they grieve his loss. A service will be held for Rick's immediate family in the coming weeks. Prayers for Rick as he ascends into the loving arms of our God. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers for Michael Mard, Jean Rogers' nephew, whose new baby Mateo is in critical care and will be for several more weeks. We lift up Isabel, Mateo's mother, and Mateo's grandparents during this stressful and fearful time. We pray for Mateo's medical team that they make wise choices in his care. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up all those who have sick or terminal pets today, including Terry, Ken, and Bella D'Ambrosio. We pray for all those making difficult choices so that their beloved furry friends can be at peace. May God wrap these humans and the animals they love in a warm blanket of care. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We lift up all those in our community living with health struggles, including cancer, dementia, and addiction. We pray for their loved ones as they care for them alongside them. We pray that God continues to support them on the road towards healing, whatever healing might look like for them. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we lift up all of those prayers that we hold in the quiet spaces of our spirits. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we show our gratitude to you for so many reasons. We praise you for the vibrancy of our world, for the love in our hearts, for the beauty of music, and for our hope for tomorrow. And today, especially, we thank you for being our refuge in times of trouble. trouble our everlasting port in the storms of our lives. There are other gods that promise us security and control in our world. We have been lured by the promises of money, beauty, and even retaliation and fear. But we know that the only true protection is you, O oh God of our lives. For when our strength, our courage, our plans run dry, it is you who sits with us in the squall until we reach calmer waters. We know that with your counsel and your steadfastness, we cannot be carved away by hardship like water carves into stone. With you before us and behind us, we cannot be moved. Therefore we rejoice, for we know we are secure in your love. You will never give us up you will never abandon us. Indeed, it is you who has taught us what faithfulness is and does. We walk with you down the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness and joy, and we rest in your hands evermore. Amen. During our offering time this morning, I want to lift up our world service team and one of the long-standing and most loved missions that they offer to us every year at this time of year, which is the Christmas drive. So I'd like to call on Nancy Proxman, a member of our world service team, who has more information about how we can participate in those drives and bring Christmas to many families in need in our area. Good morning. I'd like to start off by thanking everyone that participated in the kitchen kit drives. It was a huge success. We've already delivered two of them to families that needed them. And we just want to thank you for your continued support. Your generosity is really um, heartwarming. Thank you. Um, as Maureen said, we, we do this every year. We have a Christmas gift drive for local organizations that need our help during Christmas. And we are going to be doing it. The signups will be all virtual this year. But never fear if you're uncomfortable doing the sign up online or you would prefer help. Um, we will have world service team members 
on hand outside, um, downstairs, not outside, <laughs> on November 14th today and next week and the 28th. So if you need a little help or you're unsure how it works, we can certainly help you with that. Um, as a result, we won't have, we have a Christmas tree and we have stars. This is what they look like, but instead of having names on them, because the sign up is online, it gives you the website and it gives you the important dates. So the drive will go November 14th today through December 1st, and the gifts are due back on December 5th. And there's an information sheet out there if you want to just take the information sheet and the star and go home. You can do it yourself. Um, there's people outside to help you. There's also on the website, which is what this link is, it gives you all the information as well. And it's also in the Spire. So you should be able to get information and help from wherever you need it. And we hope you participate and thank you for your help. Thank you, Nancy. And in celebration of this, of this mission and in all the ways that we give back to God in our world, let's join together in our prayer of dedication as printed in the bulletin. For the breath of life, for eyes to see, for insight to believe, for courage to witness, we give thanks, gracious God. The signs of your presence are everywhere. May this offering serve as our witness to your grace and peace. Breathe your spirit into us so that it may transform, inspire, and equip us in your service. Amen. And as we end our time together this morning, I remind you that we have two offering plates in the back, one for a regular offering and one for the Geekin's Thanksgiving uh, basket. And I also remind you to remain in your seats as Michael plays our postlude and our ushers will dismiss you. And we invite you, if you have no place to run off to, to come down to our community room by going down the stairs and walking to the back of the church and join us for a time of refreshments. And let's go out into the world now in peace and have courage and hold on to what is good. Return no evil for evil Strengthen the faint-hearted, help the suffering, welcome the stranger, and rejoice in hope. And whether we're seeking refuge or have the ability to be a source of refuge for others, may we reflect the presence of God in this world and be grace-filled and joy-filled and compassionate-filled as we walk in the footsteps of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.